Welcome to the Alapa Podcast, the home for cultural chit chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk. Welcome to the Alarpa Podcast, and this is Mary, sitting next to me, sorry. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm your other guy, well, guy, other person. Uh, so, that was a disaster of an intro, but anyway, <laughs> let us keep going, let's horse on, sure. It's a podcast that's 40 minutes and the first 20 seconds are awful, what's the matter? So, uh, we've been very busy uh, recently, uh, as we say in every podcast, because we suffer from the disease of being busy. We like telling people we're busy because it makes us feel important. Does it not? <laughs> but we are busy a bit. We are busy a bit. Uh, we finally saw the book that we translated uh, back in April, looking pretty nice, I have to say. <laughs> Lots of images of the Saint Death and all this Mexican illustration and stuff like that. Um, and more books in the pipeline. In fact, you've been given a book uh, as well. You flicked through it. I, I know you probably can't go into too much detail about it because it's still relatively unpublished, but uh, but are you excited about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 let's say it's interesting. Okay, that's a great euphemism. And uh, well, also speaking of unpublished books, you alerted me to a book about the big fella, Mick Collins, uh, last week. Uh, I did. Yeah, it was kind of interesting, no? Well, I have to say the abstract didn't make it very clear what uh, the point was that they were trying to make, you know? Like, obviously, it was a biography, but, you know, it's uh, been yeah, two or three, hasn't it? Well, yes, but a few, all right. I mean, I'd be interested to see um, what they do with it, because, you know, sometimes you have archives being opened after a long time, and it adds more information, but I don't think really... Uh, new sources have come to light. So it is definitely a reinterpretation of existing sources. Now, I'm kind of intrigued by it because they do mention, you know, they, they demolish the myth of, of Michael Collins and they kind of refer to him as the man that won the war, which is also kind of a refrain that rings uh, heavy in the movie as well. So I'm not sure if they're tackling the movie Michael Collins or the kind of real life Michael Collins, uh, but some people on Twitter weren't too happy with the prospect of the book anyway. Um, but what is interesting as well is that uh, they also say, well, you know, people think he won the war because he's always wearing military uniforms. But I think, again, most people that kind of know the story know that uh, there's very few photographs of him surviving. And he was famous for going around Dublin on a bicycle with a smile, a wave, a nod, and a suit. And it was only recently, uh, or not recently, but it was only towards the end of his life when the Civil War was, was kicking off that he was kind of in military gear. Um, and he became more of a prominent symbol of of kind of a military entity you know so again i haven't read the book but it'd be interesting to see where they take it and uh to agree or disagree with the points but we can also share that book as well uh, so you've also borrowed some books from me recently <laughs> <laughs> i haven't read them yet though but um they look interesting i was actually gonna tell you about uh, this editorial the publishing house that was uh publishing this book the yeah, michael collins ones that hasn't come out yet that also I saw they're the same publishers of um, a book that of a project that I think we talked about some time ago about uh, the abandoned schools of Ireland. Oh, I think I do, do remember. You remember? That. Yeah, yeah. And then I was surprised to see that uh, that was like actually a book that came out yesterday by the same publishers. Oh, really? Um, and then there was another one on like. Um, like houses of Ireland or something like that, and then I thought, hmm, you know, like it's not very common for a publishers to do. As much as I like the project of the abandoned schools of Ireland, and there's some great photos and great information because the guy has collected a lot of um, a lot of info about how everything used to work in each county and all this, and that's quite nice. Mm, I don't know. It's like like houses of Ireland. I mean, as much as like houses are beautiful, <laughs> but it's a bit strange for a publishing house to do two things like that and then something like a Michael Collins biography. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I 
I, I imagine that they're chasing the niche route ones expensive books on a narrow subject. Um mm. and they sell maybe a hundred of them or something like that. Uh, but this my one is definitely more general. You're you're familiar with more um academic texts, so is it normal for a book that's already been written? Well I guess it isn't isn't the academic text, it's popular history really. But a book that's already been written to be in limbo, um and hasn't been published yet, but it's been advertised on the website of the publisher though. yeah I found that quite strange how much time especially when yeah. for example these two have come out because when I read that that it'd been kind of like waiting for a while I thought okay so this publishing house must be broke or something yeah yeah and then yesterday when I saw that the other two were coming out I was like alright so why was this one actually it could be though because you know? we checked the website and we checked the submissions page and they said we're not accepting submissions yeah, now, so, <laughs> so actually they probably are tightening the purse strings a little bit yeah it's kind of like um, like strange that they, they they decided to publish the other two um, but well I don't know it's all uh, intrigue. Um, we shall I, wait till it's out. <laughs> uh, speaking of Ireland, uh, Gathy or Denny's? Oh, not Denny's. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the quiz was a, is Denny's is a turkey. This is a bonus round. No, uh, that's Dustin. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Gathy and Denny's are two brands of like sausages and bacon. <laughs> so. <laughs> this is advanced. This is like C2 of uh, Irish culture. Yeah, we're well, even C2 English speaker though, aren't you? Yeah, but no see to our culture. Just say Galti and we go, we'll move the parts. Okay, here. right, Galti. <laughs> Great answer, <laughs> Bagara. Anyway, uh, oh, actually, speaking of which, I was looking for, because we were editing the, the Irish dancing video, mm -hmm. I was looking for Irish voice uh, sound effects. So I want to have like an Irish voice in the background uh, at one point, just like saying something, I don't know, whatever it was. And I found an Irish um, accent uh, a sound effect on YouTube, where it's just like a man saying, different sentences in comedy Irish accents. Uh-huh. So it's like, oh, gorgeous. Oh, yeah. I will, yeah. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I was like two minutes. Um, and were they all right? Or? Well, I think the guy was genuinely Irish, yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't know who, uh, okay. I don't know who is editing or who would ever need that. But yeah. uh, the fact that it exists, I, I'm sure There's it would, a niche for that. It would fulfill some niche. But uh, anyway, so Patsu is coming up. Uh, so, Please bear with us, and we'll be with you momentarily. So welcome back to part two of the podcast. So anyway, um, travel. We spoke about it a little bit in the previous episode, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more today as well. So uh, we'll kind of amble into it. I showed you a National Geographic video, uh, yes. which I thought was very interesting because basically this video was called After the Tone. It's like a narrative piece from the National Geographic, which is surprising in itself because obviously they are more famous for documentaries. Yeah. And it was called The Untold Beauty of Traveling Alone. Now... Uh, if when you kind of encounter this concept in videos or in YouTube channels or popular culture, I, I, what, like how do they address it? What's the kind of stylistic choice that they make when telling the story? Well, normally they just show the person in different places, kind of like experiencing things with the locals and, you know, kind of like sitting on the edge of a cliff looking at some landscapes and things like that. Yeah. I would say. Uh, also, I think as well it's done... I don't know, it's kind of probably done in a more upbeat way, uh, or from the perspective of the traveler, so it's kind of very chirpy music, and maybe, I don't know, they share a beer with a local, and there's a cheeky smile, yeah. or they try to get confused in a market stall, and the person's like, oh, you... Exactly, and they crack up laughing. Yeah. Yeah, with the street vendor and things like that. Cut to playing football with the kids, scoring a goal, <laughs> celebrating like mad, yes. and then a girl maybe looking at the traveler going, hmm, foreigner. <laughs> Yes, that, I think that, that's that. a pretty cliche. <laughs> well, um, but this is this is different because it's from the perspective of a girl um, who didn't go on the trip with the guy. So presumably, we don't know the backstory. They had plans to go away together, so they're a romantic couple. Uh, she pulled out at the last second for whatever reason. So the whole video are is, is kind of framed around images of um, of 
where this man is. We don't know who this guy is, and we don't really hear his voice until the end of the video. All the things he's seeing. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're it away. <laughs> um, and it's really beautiful shots, like very well taken. And uh, there's none of that football stuff or the the street vendor stuff. Yeah. Um, and then she calls periodically, saying, "Hey, I haven't heard from you. Hey, let me know you're okay." Uh, and then still no answer. Uh, you are you fine? <laughs> are you okay? Yes. Um, and then finally uh, he uh, she picks up the phone. So she for the whole video she's calling and then she goes hello and then the guy says hello um, and that's the end of the movie yeah. uh, or the short clip. I thought it was a really interesting way of telling that story because um, it's a, a really it's a unique way of emphasizing how when you're traveling alone and you really immerse yourself into it, it's a complete disconnection from everything that you're doing now in this story it has the angle of the romantic mishap that something has happened perhaps uh, so maybe not everything is perfect in the land of their of their relationship uh, and that's uh, I think adds like a great narrative structure to it but also I think it just shows as well when you are um, traveling alone you're really into it you're not even conscious of yourself you're just you know because we don't know who this guy is but we're just seeing everything that he's seeing uh, but you have a few misgivings about it. No, no, it's just... Well, for starters, the, the story, well, I think it was... Um, uh, basically, it was done on purpose that it was... It wasn't very clear what had happened because at some point, I mean, you think it's like something to do with a relationship, but then at some point he says something like something awful happened and you blame me or something like that. You, so... I don't know, it's as if there was like a something else that was like external to yeah. the relationship. I, I suppose they do that on purpose, but the thing is like, I don't know, it just gave me an unsettling feeling because I just don't like the idea that, uh, you know, that he went away and there was something like unresolved. No, because they were a couple just in, in general, you know, that with any like a close uh, friendship or, you know, and like... I don't know, I just, I didn't like the idea that, uh, that I'm <laughs> so stupid, but I sound like a little kid, I don't know. No, no, it, it's, it's, it's obviously painful. I kind of, like, I couldn't enjoy, like, the part of, like, uh, him being on his own and all this, because I kept on thinking... Well, there's, but I think though. <laughs> and in that way, it was gripping. I mean, you know. It, yeah, but it told two stories, uh, very, it told two stories very sparingly great economy of, of language and time and everything yeah. because the two stories is that he wanted to travel and he wanted to share it with her but for whatever reason he couldn't hmm. but he just went and did it anyways it's like okay well I'm going to commit yeah. to this and not only did he commit to it but he's, he's genuinely uh, probably having a nice experience there and still obviously probably thinking about her at the back of his mind that's why he calls her at the end but but uh, that's one story where you're traveling and you're committing to it regardless of the outside distractions and maybe the outside pain but then from the other perspective as well, probably when she pulled out, she probably felt she had maybe subconsciously the power. There's like a power move in a way. I don't mean that in a cynical way. It's like if I do this, I'll win whatever the argument. But she's probably a little bit more in control of the situation. But now that she hasn't heard from him and that she's gone, that he's gone, uh, you can see it from the perspective of her. It's like, oh, it's regretting perhaps not going and wondering what's happening, you know. So, uh, Which I think is a perspective that you don't really see very often either. And it's another story, another strand to the story, which I think, again, is told really, really interestingly uh, by this National Gra Ge Geographic short. We will put the link in the description of the podcast as well. Um, so, I, well, I think you're impressed by the images anyway. And yeah, it's very much so. I mean, no, and I appreciate it. Like, uh, as you said, it was told in a very different way and... And it was gripping because you didn't know what was happening and, and it kind of made you think of a different perspective. So so all of that was good, you know. And and I mean, not not everything is designed to uh, make you feel like super happy. Like a lot of things, well, they just want to kind of like stir up a feeling and that doesn't necessarily have to be a reassuring feeling, you know. So um, I think as well, to just create a great atmosphere, a great mood. Um, mm. And again, it's unique because it's not just a typical happy-go-lucky song and, and all those things we discussed at the kind of first mentions of this video when we started talking about it, no? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of a segue into what we want to talk about as well. We've been both independently of each other teaching uh, traveling <laughs> is a political act. Um, I've been teaching it quite successfully, I think. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> of course. I mean, how could you? <laughs> I've been teaching it quite gravely, as usual. Uh, I never said that, by the way. Let's put that be on the yeah, record. Yeah, yeah. I never said uh, it was perfect and expensive. You're 
quality of teaching. I'm sure it's equally as good. <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, um, have you ever thought about this, that traveling is a political act? Because to be honest with you, I haven't really pondered it greatly before kind of researching and developing the lesson, you know? <laughs> uh, spending hours... Yeah, uh, <laughs> we were actually reading the common article that we read that we both happened to come across. Yeah, I hadn't. Uh, no, I hadn't given it much thought. I mean, I know there are people that won't go to certain places because of the regimes that they have, or that uh, they're uncomfortable with, like certain situations or certain political dramas and stuff like that. So, yeah. So yeah, I mean that that's that's I suppose the most obvious side of it. Um, yeah, well, no, I think that's that's true. We'll explore that, of course. One of my warm ups uh, is I ask people to fill the sentence, mm, blank is a political act. I've heard, uh, obviously, where you, uh, where you buy your clothes, because Nike and Zara, I think, has a trouble as well. Uh, one student said, uh, rescue dogs. She will never buy a dog. She will always rescue a dog because she thinks, like, a lot of dogs. Are they are already looking for a home and you don't need to buy one to kind of give one love and, and all that stuff. So, uh, I don't know, what other things could be considered political acts? Oh, I suppose for some people, what you eat as well. What you eat, definitely, yeah. Because uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think in 2050, projections say that meat uh, and even possibly dairy production will be unsustainable. So even if we continue to eat dairy unconsciously, hmm. someone could regard that as a political act. As well, um, if you watch the show, well, you can't watch it anymore because Rosanna has been cancelled. But uh, if it was brought back, probably a lot of people would watch it as a political kind of sentiment as well. So it's kind of like people always say, you know, don't bring politics into football, for example. But everything can become really politicized uh, for good or for bad. Uh, any other student, dear student, uh, any other uh, ideas of what could be considered a political action? Transport, for example. Transport, okay. Uh, like Uber, no? Yeah, whether you use this, you decide to to use uh, those sort of like um, services. Whether you will even like get in a car, or you yeah. refuse to and you just want to cycle, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, Uber is an interesting case, but I think you know we are seeing a new generation of these types of companies. Amazon um, have been around for a long time, so they're not quite of that generation, but they do share some characteristics. Um, Deliveroo, Uber, uh, their kind of arrangements with their workers, they have a special contract situation. They don't, I think a lot of workers are aggrieved and not paid enough. Uh, in the case of Uber, uh, when they first started, they were considered an illegal taxi service, were issued a cease and desist, but they just ignored it. Uh, they did this infamous God view, where uh, at a launch party for something, they kind of showed off how they could track users' movements and everything. And people got very upset about that. And also, uh, two very negative things. One was uh, one blogger criticized the practices of the company, uh, and they tried to smear her uh, and discredit her. And another was um, where they gave people lots of uh, mobiles, kind of these untraceable mobiles. I think they're called burner mobiles in the States, mm -hmm. and credit cards. And Lyft is their competitor. So they got people, those people to book um, trips with Lyft. And then, like, cancel them at the last minute in, in an effort to disrupt their service and everything. Um, so that is, um, obviously, so a lot of underhand practices. But they're still, their profits are growing at an exponential rate. So I always ask about my students, who is to blame for this? Is it the government? Uh, I mean, look at London. They banned Uber in the city. So that was a positive action, you could argue. Um, but a lot of other governments uh, seem to be happy to let them operate. You could also say as well, perhaps, that... Um, it's the fault of the company because they're the people putting these things into practice. Also, as well, you have the consumer, the client. Uh, like some of my students have said, well, they would try not to use it, but if there's no other alternative, they would use it, for example. So mm -hmm. I think it's also interesting to talk about this because of the Nike Colin Copernic. Copernic uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm saying that properly, but uh, adverts uh, where obviously they're tapping into this very obvious awareness of social issues and trying to make money out. If it hurt their bottom line, they wouldn't be featuring him into uh, into adverts but um, my question for you Mary is have you been burning your night trainers <laughs> <laughs> no I haven't had night trainers for quite a while yeah yeah for a long time since I played basketball but I mean I don't know I mean the whole thing I think it was just very hypocritical yeah um, but it's a it's a, I don't know it's, it's a very complicated thing but it's just a wider thing of ethics but we're kind of going back to travel um the travel is political thing. Um, 
like they mentioned Spain in that article that it's one of the reasons two of the reasons they say that travel is good is because it can spread uh, ideas and exchange ideas and also it can spread democracy and they mentioned the case of Spain where to, to prop up the ailing economy which is a direct quote by the way from that article uh, Franco allowed a lot of tourists into the country now um, probably if it is true it's a unique example of it being true because I don't think it, it, it kind of happens in other countries even though we did mention before in Romania because they're watching illegal tapes of uh, like American movies it helped the fall of communism because they could see the outside world but I don't think I'm not sure if it really works though in other areas but if it if, if it is true in Spain this would be a very unique example but I can see by your face you're gonna, <laughs> you're not, you don't agree with that so uh, you're the Spanish person please no. jump in here well just because I don't think that that's the right example because that's the opposite process I mean you're talking about like traveling being a political act then it has to be something that comes from the person that wants to travel yeah if you're talking about a government that is like you know, opening up uh, the country to to travelers in order to to get more income, and, and uh, which is what happened in Spain. That's a different matter. I mean, it's the opposite process. Well, I don't like it. I think it's, a, know, it's because think... they didn't encourage people to go to other places. Uh, other than the ones that had to go out of necessity. They didn't encourage. You know them, I mean? they, they did encourage them to to interact with the tourists because. Uh, when people came first, Madrilenes were um, kind of seen as dour, maybe, which is understandable because of living under a grim dictatorship. But then you have the Madrid Smile slogan, which comes from those days, which is still living, no? Is that like Madrid Sunray, no? Well, but yeah. in any case, that would be, I don't know, the main purpose of that was like to get a financial advantage by yeah. getting foreigners to spend money not for Spanish people to be able to open their horizons yeah. by mixing with other foreigners but do you think it would happen as a byproduct as a, a natural well, transfer you know well, it just, it just yeah. happens but naturally it might happen yeah. yeah 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 I mean it might happen but we're not talking about a political act yeah. you know from on the part of the person that travels you know what I mean yeah. it's like another way maybe of uh, reaching the same the same end, but uh, but here what the article was talking about the subject was like the act of traveling, how that in itself was political, not the other way around, in my opinion. Well, they do talk about um, <laughs> they do talk about other places like going to Cuba. Like one of the top things to see there is the Museum of the Revolution, and that's when you're being politicized or being shown propaganda. But it is kind of ignoring the fact that people can make up their own mind about it as well. They can go and see it and think, well, I don't agree with any of that. Or they can think, well, viva la revolucion, you know? So there's that factor in the equation as well, I guess. But um, in terms of traveling and, and spreading knowledge, I think also another problem is the tourist industry is an industry. So I think countries are very savvy because people are very savvy what sells and what people expect of them. So, of course, in our respective countries, you might be like, oh... They just want to see, you know, dancing on tables or siesta or Sevilla, Sevillanas <laughs> or something like that. But then when tourists come, that's what we sell to them. That's like, that's what we're trying to market. So we're, we hate the stereotype, but we sell the stereotype, for example. So in one way, that can be a roadblock as well into true understanding between people, you know. But uh, but I don't know. So I guess it's very open um, ended because you would assume that people who travel are open minded, but not everybody is. No, no, certainly not. And I think probably massification of traveling has led to uh, uh, people being more close-minded. I mean, I know it sounds like a paradox, but but actually the fact that more people can afford to travel yeah. leads to kind of like a lot of people just traveling for the sake of traveling and and not absorbing anything from the places they are. Yeah. You know, like the, the place they're visiting, like they pass by there and they just don't see anything of the culture or, you know. But as we learned from the video, have a fight with your significant other, go on your own. <laughs> and because you'd be so wanting to forget the, the problems in your relationship or life, you'll just bury yourself into the local culture. Yeah. According to the National Geographic anyway. But um, no, I think that's that's very true as well. But um, yeah, like it's, it's cause as I said, people bring their own prejudices. prejudices. Another student of mine said um, that she gets uh, 
frustrated if she's in a restaurant in another culture, in another country, and they're slow bringing the food or the beer because she's so used to it being a bit prompter in Spain uh, or in another culture. So uh, it's funny how we kind of can't leave go of those things, or we have a certain cultural view of this being good and this being bad in terms of fast service means modern country, maybe sophistication, mm. uh, urbane this perhaps but um so yeah but also as well i i know a girl from university who went to china and she was literally forced to be in a video i think at the airport about how great china was and also even mentioning a little bit about how tibet was also chinese so oh, dear. uh so to finish off this segment uh i'll ask you the question uh, have you ever been in a country where you have felt that somebody was trying to uh use propaganda on you or something was such an obvious example of of selling a specific uh, part of the country, you know? Because uh, actually, I know another Spanish girl, she was in Coventry, and she said, uh, like, a lot of people are saying, oh, we like you because you're you're a white, but we don't like all the other immigrants, you know? Uh, so that was a very, like, ugly example of how, like, uh, this is our view of a place, and we want you to be part of it, and these people not to be part of it. So they're kind of, like, trying to indoctrinate you into that a little bit. That's a very, like, grim example of that. But I don't know, have you ever been exposed to that, even in a trivial way? Well, I have come across examples of what you've just said, of the differentiating between, like, types of uh, foreigners and even between, like, you and the rest of the foreigners from your country, uh, which is, of course, bizarre, but, I mean, that's a different matter. It's more related to, like, racism, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but in terms of, like, being, like, forced to uh, give a certain um, propaganda, no, not really, I don't know. I mean... You know, kind of like saying, oh, well, please say good things about uh, about uh, the country, for example, in the case of Egypt, but, but as in, you know, tell people that it's safe to come, that we that we welcome them, you know. Okay. Uh, but because of the, the issues that they've had, that uh, they've lost their means of living because uh, of, of turis- uh, tourism disappearing, first because of uh, the political situation, and then out of basically... Uh, propaganda but against them you know what I mean that's true uh, so I mean people and that's quite like when people tell you that you know it, it, I don't feel manipulated I feel like they, like it's something that I should really help them with well no it's a very human thing you're desperate to you know to show well there's a lot more to this might be Alan Patridge there's a lot more to Ireland than that uh, that's what yeah. Alan Patridge makes fun of the boys actually who wrote Paul or Ted but you know because we do associate a place with, with war if it's a if it's experienced violent problems but of course there's so much more richness to it as well so of course they want to show it off as well because it is existing there it is true and there's actually a great bbc podcast i'll try and find it for you it's from like two years ago uh, where this uh, egyptian guy who was a hotel worker was kind of going around showing like where he would normally bring people on tours and everything but also describing how he's lost a lot of business because of the social problems there as well so i think that's a very positive example you've experienced so you haven't really experienced the the full-blown, you know, this is the greatest country in the world, and... No, but then again, I mean, I haven't, like, traveled that much in comparison to to other people, so... Like me? <laughs> well, I haven't been across the pond you have, for example, so... That's true. I have been to Boston, yeah. Uh, but I didn't have, feel anything there. I, I was very inspired and impressed by Boston. It's a very beautiful place. A lot of history there. It's the JFK Presidential Library. I remember as well in the park, they have, like, these three statues where they say... Uh, I think it was like labor, uh, industry. I don't know. I can't remember to think, but they had like very inspiring words in them as well. So uh, that's kind of an example, I guess, of, of, of osmosis. When something has a lot of rich culture and you're surrounded by it, you can kind of appreciate it. So, so yeah, sorry, listener, no terrible examples of uh, <laughs> of, a, of a regime uh, telling us what to think. But uh, but yeah, so thank you very much for listening to part two. I think that's everything. So we'll be joining you momentarily in the third part. So welcome to part three of the show. So Mary, you were making me aware of certain days that were in it uh, off air. Can you expand a little bit? <laughs> well, tomorrow um, is um, Alzheimer's Awareness Day. I, I believe it's tomorrow, 21st of September. And last week or the week before, I can't remember, was um, Suicide Prevention Week. Okay. Yes. 
And well, we've talked about uh, mental health before, I think. Um, yeah, it's like second or third podcast. Yeah, but I, I just, well, first of all, it was a long time ago, but also I don't think it's something that can be talked about too much. Um, you know, because obviously there are two different things, but in the case of like suicide and and mental illness, we're always talking about how there's still a big stigma yeah. in society and, you know, well, there are a lot of initiatives to try and get people to, to talk about what's, what's eating them and how they feel and just to make sure that they share things so it doesn't get to a point where they feel they're not able to cope. Yeah. Um, so I've seen quite a bit of that, like, in social media and... I think it's important, you know, people sharing stories about uh, uh, relatives, you know, and just how the signs that they saw and the signs that they, they didn't see. And well, I think it's it's all important. And with regards to um, Alzheimer's, that's something that, uh, he, well, that I'm quite familiar with. And I, I, I think it's, it's something that affects like many families, you know, with like elderly people and not so elderly. And yeah, I don't know. I think the campaign in Spain struck me because it focused on people that were younger and 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 were having like this this kind of issues and how it, it affects their their lives and their self esteem and so on. So I think it's also something important to to know about and to. To respect and kind of like to be careful uh, about with like people, you know, when yeah. when you suspect that this could be happening to them, even if they're even if they're not as old as you would expect. Yeah, well, it, it is something that can happen to um, younger people, but even with mental health, in YouTube last week there have been three separate videos from creators who don't know each other. Um, well, actually, no, two on YouTube and one on a podcast. Uh, Blind Boy did a two-part series the last two weeks about CBT and cognitive behavior therapy. And it, his hobby horse has always been mental. Well, I shouldn't say hobby horse because that sounds like it's something trivial. But he's very been very passionate about mental health, and that's and more power to him. And and he always gets a good response. But uh, he put on Twitter yesterday that people have been reacting very positively to to those uh, podcasts where he kind of breaks down how you know well not easy but how like what the simple steps you can follow to kind of have a better control over your mental health which is very important and then he's kind of flabbergasted about why it hasn't been taught in schools because if we're educated at a young age and given these tools in our arsenal then um we're probably better prepared for for the world Mm -hmm. as it is and he goes through the abcs uh, so uh He's very self-deprecating. He's very modest. So he kind of says, well, like, this is like somebody showing you the food pyramid for the first time. But again, the ABCs, you know, if you have like an irrational reaction to something, writing it down and looking for the evidence and then deciding kind of how you're going to use that evidence, you know, so that you kind of recognize that, oh, this is an irrational thought and just kind of catch it and and uh, kind of work your way back into a more realistic frame of thinking. Uh, but also, you might be familiar with one of the characters, Jay from The Inbetweeners. He has a YouTube channel where he plays video games, but uh, he's actually very socially awkward. And uh, his, his last podcast, he was just doing a Q&A, and he was just saying how YouTube was kind of good for his confidence. How very often when he was pr- promoting the movies, he'd just sit behind and think, oh, well, these guys, my castmates, are more interesting, uh, have more to say, are funnier, and it's better, and I'm just an idiot. And then, like, because he gets so many positive comments on YouTube, because he's a nice, he comes across as a very nice guy. Uh, he feels like, oh, maybe I'm not that worthless, you know. So, like, um, you know, it was very nice to see somebody so kind of upfront about it and kind of, in a way, comfortable with it. But, you know, he's a nice guy, so he deserves a lot of positive uh, mental health. But even Casey Neistat as well on YouTube, he did a piece yesterday where some guy was shaving on the train and it went viral. And he was almost going to retweet the video because it was, like, so New York in his words. But... He didn't because the story, uh, but he didn't. And then he kind of realized, he found out later the next day, it was in the newspaper that he was a homeless guy who like asked his family for money. They gave him some money and he wanted to, he didn't have time in the shelter to, to shower or shave. So he wanted to spruce himself up and look presentable for his family, you know? So it's a very human story and a very hard story. And, you know, it, it's, you know, Casey did the right thing and not contributing to the trivialization of it becoming a meme or something viral uh, because at the end of the day, it's it's something you know someone's real 
kind of broken life and the guy involved uh, said like please don't share the video because this is the story uh, behind it and the brother is also saying as well like yeah I mean this guy is just you know he's just a normal guy uh, and he just shaved in the train because a lot of these things that happen I think we've spoken before about like how even like in Spain people say about the siesta and everything or whatever I think we might mention in previous podcasts but whatever looks strange from the outside or whatever there's always like some kind of logic to it for the person performing it you know so if someone's acting weird in the train maybe that person's a crazy person but also as well there's mm-hmm. there's some kind of external circumstance that uh, is dictating why that is happening right now in this present moment you know so yeah uh, but i think that makes sense i mean i remember there was a charity a few years ago in spain i don't know if it's still going that was uh formed by hairdressers and they just went around sort of like shaving um whoever wanted it in the streets like beggars and um and giving them haircuts for free just because a lot of the time it seems something stupid but just you know like when when people have gone through a lot like mm, seeing themselves physically different or you know having like that kind of a treat it's not something superficial like it can actually have a really deep impact in a person's uh, self-esteem yeah um yeah you hear about that in india as well where people like bade uh, homeless people or give them haircuts or trim their beards also just you know some kind of positive human contact and of course you can you can yeah. chat while you're doing it as well so it's very important so so yeah so normally patry is a bit more jovial but um but you know uh, for the two weeks that had significant days mm-hmm. regarding health both physical and mental um you know i think it's important to give yourself a hug practice self-empathy and look after yourself as well so um so yeah we won't plug anything off the back of that because it would seem uh, a bit uh, obscene so uh, thank you very much for listening to the podcast and we'll be back next week with another episode but i think you're going to say something no you're not okay so, <laughs> so good luck then thank you bye what was i gonna say the Alapa podcast the home for cultural chit-chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk.